Hi, everyone. It's so glad to... Um, I can't see you because I'm, uh, my, there's, I'm being blinded right now in a good way. Um, but I'm so glad to be here again. Thank you to 1517 for inviting me. It's always such a joy to uh, come to this conference. It really uh, fuels my uh, sense of self-importance in a, in, a, <laughs> in a crucial way. Um, the title of my talk today is Why Everyone Actually Goes to Church, or Son of Seculosity. <laughs> now, I was assigned this talk uh, because five years ago I wrote a book called Seculosity, uh, which was how all sorts of everyday activities have come to function religiously for us in our lives. It, the core notion you need to know about that book and the, my credential, therefore, for giving this talk, is uh, it, it put forward the idea that Westerners aren't any less religious than we've always been, despite what the polls say or despite what, the, what we answer on the census form. We've just become religious about different things. Or you might say we've become even more religious about many more things mainly to our detriment, I believe. Because what it means to be alive in 2024 is to be in church pretty much all the time, but not necessarily the kind of church you've been hearing described so beautifully uh, today. It's uh, the churches that produce anxiety. So as anxiety has ratcheted up in our culture, so too has our religiosity. Now I'll try to take, explain what I mean. Um, because when I use the word religion, what, is, what does that actually uh, entail? Well, it does, a capital R religion does, um, does entail formal church going and confessions of faith and uh, simply capital G, God. But the, that which um, our functional religion in our life is simply that which we rely on for purpose, meaning, belonging, ritual, what I call enoughness or righteousness, and even transcendence and immortality. Um, and in that sense, we've never been churchier. Uh, in the book, I talk about how parenting has come to function religiously for people, romance, food, career, busyness, even fandom have become targets of seculosity. So for the sake of this talk, I, and seculosity is just the catch-all word for sort of religious um, energy or devotion that is aimed at kind of horizontal rather than vertical targets. <clears throat> So in this talk, I wanted to kind of uh, take a look at what's happened in the past five years since that book was published. Has seculosity abated? Have there's been a mass migration back to capital C church? Or as Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher says, has, have, have seculosity simply exploded? Are there more uh, targets, more potential um, um, religions, you might say, li little r religions, uh, crowding the marketplace than ever before. My sense is that seculosity has only accelerated. Like all things, you and I and our neighbors are still looking for justification and enoughness everywhere we go. We're still looking to answer that increasingly free-floating voice of condemnation that lives outside, but also inside. So where are we seeking spiritual nourishment today? Where are we looking for life? And where are we sort of getting glimpses of it, tastes of it? I'm going to give you five examples, and they're going to come in order from the most benign, a.k.a nice, to the most malignant or deadly, in my view. These are just five. There's plenty more, and there are five that are very 
tied to my own experience as a 40-something father living in central Virginia. So I want to ask you that if this first one does not speak to you in the slightest, wait for the second one. (laughs) And if the second one doesn't speak to you, wait for the third one. But before I get into it, one of the ways in which I think the book, one of the reasons it appealed to people and continues to is that it allows Christians to feel superior. <sighs> I, maybe it was the marketers, maybe it was something in my own you know, spirit, but we have tended to there, look down on all of these terrible replacement religions and, oh, shouldn't people just get on board with what we've got because we have the answer. There is a way to sort of absent ourselves from the diagnosis, but Christians are not immune from this. In fact, many of the churches that we attend seem to uh, resemble um, replacement religions more than the real thing. So I want to say, first of all, that um, there are two caveats about seculosity that are become extremely dear to me in talking about it. First of all, the, the, the degree and... Um, extent of seculosity in the world is a measure of two things. One, it is a measure of how much pain and loneliness people are in. It's not a measure necessarily of smug rebellion all the time. It's usually a measure of the degree of pain and loneliness that people find themselves in. Secondly, it is a measure of the degree to which the church has failed. So, I hope you uh, enjoyed my talk. I am (laughs) leaving now. Uh, But I just want to poke through or puncture any superiority that you and I, especially me, might have before we delve in, because it's going to get a little funny and a little bit silly in here in a moment. The first church that we are many of us are attending on a daily, if not hourly basis, is the Church of Celebrity. And by that, I mean mainly the Church of Taylor Swift. (laughs) This is a meme uh, recently. Taylor Swift tells Swifties it's almost time to shed their physical bodies and ascend. Now, I am on shaky ground here, this is, which is indicative of just how sacred uh, this woman, this incredibly talented and very successful and shrewd and f- amazing person is, okay? <laughs> but it has become, in certain circles, something of a hate crime to impugn Taylor's character or music. Okay, and that um, means that uh, seculosity has entered the building. Uh, I, for one, am genuinely frightened by her fan base. (laughs) They are vindictive and remorseless, and as vindictive and remorseless a a social uh, force as I can remember in online life. Uh, It is also, though, of course, not a unified fan base. Like any church, there are factions, and they hate each other. (laughs) Okay? I I can refer you to the articles. I can quote you chapter and verse. But why is it that people are fixated on Swift in this way? Why is it that many, not just some, many people in my community have flown their families to Europe to go see her in concert because they couldn't afford to see her in concert in America. You have stories of a bunch of young Argentinians camping out for five months in order to get tickets. That's not cute, that's insane. And so what is it? That is harnessing an enormous amount of emotional uh, bandwidth. Uh, What is going on? Well, I think people are fixated on Swift in this way, uh, mainly because, not just because her music is great. There's a lot of great music out there. Uh, But in the Swifty community, they have discovered direction and community 
and ritual, and if you talk to anyone who's been to those concerts, what they found is transcendence. Um, we have tried to invest celebrity with the hopes that once accrued to God or country. I was reading an article by a woman named Rena Raphael who wrote a book, a wonderful book that was seculosity adjacent called The Gospel of Wellness. And she said more and more as she interviewed college students, they told me things like, quote, listening to Taylor on Spotify is my wellness. Fans post roundups of, quote, Taylor Swift's top 10 songs for healing. That's a really strong thing to say. So what is it about? Why do so many, especially young women, listen to Taylor and say, that's me, that's me, to the extent that they're willing to fork over everything? Well, there's some good things going on here because many exclaim with awe about how hard Taylor works, but in the same breath, they say, I feel so bad for her. She's just broken up with another guy. <laughs> she is forever unlucky in love, or that's what the pre-Kelsey narrative was. <laughs> and Taylor, by her own admission, is both bejeweled and the anti-hero. She, she quotes, holds space for the dichotomy that we all experience within ourselves. We are both hero and villain in all sorts of interesting and complicated ways. And in fact, however successful she is, there's also a sense that she's still searching for stability, still trying to figure it out. And she's dealing with the incredibly acute and ongoing letdowns and enduring hurts of contemporary dating. And if you talk to anyone in the dating pool, they will tell you that it's rough out there. It's never been more rough, and that's how a lot of young people feel. As opposed to someone who's more sort of empowering like Beyonce, Swift allows for far more room to wallow and to process ambivalent feelings. So fans connect to her vulnerability. In fact, the New York Times last year uh, published a report from multiple psychiatrists who report an uptick in patients expressing themselves through Taylor Swift music. She is legitimately satisfying an emotional need, an emotional need for a growing number of Americans who don't necessarily feel like they belong to anything and that they want to be a part of something larger than themselves. Here is a phenomenon that offers a sense of grounding and kinship, a shared experience, a shared catharsis. They want to feel bigger, included in something bigger than themselves, and what's bigger than Taylor? But let's also not forget her undeniable success, because as relatable as she is, her superstardom imbues the struggles she sings about with an unspoken happy ending. My friend Todd Brewer writes, if she can rule the world, perhaps the suffering of my life today might be the beginnings of my own superhero origin story. Pairing vulnerability with a success this way can provide more than catharsis. It gives people hope. Like I said, this is the, the nicest of the, the churches we are attending. How anyone thinks this won't end poorly, I don't know, but that's a different talk. The therapy thing, though, is not arbitrary, and it leads directly to our next slide. This is a picture of, uh, that accompanied a Guardian article about the rise of therapy speak. Perhaps you know, you've heard the phrases, you know them. Toxicity, narcissism, inner children, boundaries, gaslighting, holding space. This is therapy speak, and these terms are everywhere. And we are not actually talking, though, about the church of therapy. The second item on our list is the church of, quote, therapy culture. This is distinct from therapy. I am a highly therapized person person that you're looking at. I've been in therapy for a long time. I love it. I swear by it. I quote my therapist in most of my books. I, um, I don't know where I'd be without it, okay? Caveat over. Um, therapy culture is therapy as part of one's lifestyle rather than as a medical necessity. 
Therapy culture is what happens when you offload the entire human project of living into the domain of psychiatric care. It is religious in terms of the specified jargon that's used, as well as its totalizing view of, of the world. Everything can be explained. There's a solution, and it call, it's called capital T therapy. In the place of, of rules devised by theologians or holy scripture or moral philosophy, therapy culture has erected others. I'll just give you a few of them that the writer Freddie DeBoer listed recently. One of the commandments is that you are entitled to total and complete emotional safety at all times, and this entitlement supersedes the rights and desires of other people. The second is that your own behavior is always a trauma response, and thus not your fault. The behavior of others is always freely chosen, and thus responsibility bearing. The next one, any of your behaviors is merely one small step on your journey, and you are still in the process of becoming yourself. But any behavior of others you don't like is constitutive of their very being, and they will never change. <laughs> Lastly, wanting and not getting for you can never be an expression of the basic reality of existence, but rather is always evidence of some crime abuse, mistreatment, pathology, or injustice. The result, as more and more writers who are all pro-therapy, but have, have come to balk at therapy speak and therapy culture, they, because they see it as fueling self-involvement. The most famous article about this uh, was called, Is Therapy Making Us More Selfish? And it made all the headlines this past year. Uh, plenty of commentators have noticed that therapy speak lends a sheen of medical legitimacy to self-interest. What do I mean? Well, you argue they gaslight. You have self-respect, they are narcissists. You are still growing, they are toxic. You have boundaries, they have limitations. You hold space, they stand in the way of your growth. There's little to no room for the needs of other people or even the acknowledgement of them as real. Instead, we all become bit players in each other's plays. This is particularly potent uh, contemporary religion because like all great religions, anyone who disagrees or criticizes therapeutic culture becomes an impediment to your own healing from your trauma or perhaps even guilty of re-traumatizing you. Before you know it, personal sacrifice and forgiveness become unintelligible virtues, if not reprehensible vices, recast as self-loathing, codependency, or enabling. Unfortunately, this produces not just self-involvement, but despair, because it presents an utterly, a set of utterly unattainable goals to us. It is a ladder with no end. Uh, we never graduate from therapy as way of life. The idea that you might heal and grow to the point where you don't need therapy anymore has essentially no presence in therapy culture. And yet, why is it so attractive? Well, Freddie DeBoer puts it this way. It is attractive because it is an attempt to answer a deeper dilemma facing those of us who live within a time of material abundance and spiritual emptiness. What's that dilemma? The dilemma is, without God and apple pie, how do you motivate people to be less selfish? What's happening in therapy culture amounts to answering that question by refusing its challenge, by saying we actually don't need less selfishness, but more. Are you with me? Yeah. And yet, perhaps this is less a matter of therapy overreach as evidence of a spiritual vacancy being filled. It's evidence of spiritual hunger rather than spiritual indifference or antagonism. Because the 
architecture here has been put in place to circumvent the pain of life and relationships, which, when married to an unrealistically high anthropology, sadly tends to amplify that very pain. This is a gospel that seeks to find consolation in the insistence that you and I have nothing to be forgiven of. Our chief sin, if that term even applies, is that we haven't been self-caring enough. This stands in stark contradiction to a gospel which says you have been forgiven out of love for more than you know. But you might not be convinced by what I'm saying. It might sound like an attack on mental health, and that's not at all what I'm trying to do. Again, I am not just the president of the Hair Club for Men. I am a member, okay? <laughs> I have been to more therapy than you have. Uh, but it doesn't work, at least not to therapy culture. What am I talking about? I'm saying in 2022, $51 billion was spent globally on workplace wellness programs, which in, it involved deeply embracing therapy culture in the workplace. And yet the global workforce seems to have never been so unhappy, unhealthy, and unwell. The only thing that has worked to alleviate the, 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 the lack of health has been pointing people towards serving others. That's what the data says. But therapy is a very important, um, uh, nonetheless, uh, again, I, I'll stop qualifying this, but it's nonetheless a very important way that we understand ourselves and the world. And I think in general, it's been uh, a better thing than this next one, which, uh, let's see the slide here. Oh, that's, that's a funny one from, at least my trauma made me funny. Um, it's a sweatshirt I like. Uh, this is the next one. It's a New Yorker cartoon of a therapist speaking to an unhappy man on a therapist's couch. Have you ever tried buying lots of stuff? <laughs> the next church that we are all attending uh, in this period of time is the Church of Materialism. The idea that if we could have more, we would be more. If we could get enough, we would be enough. And it is um, perhaps because I'm in middle age, I see just how um, uh, pathological, to use a therapy culture term, how pathological it has become. Uh, but the onion, no one has lampooned this better than the onion in this following headline right here. <laughs> Study, living happy life strongly correlated to thinking about property values all the time. <laughs> From the article, our data clearly indicates a direct relationship between the amount of time someone spends refreshing Zillow listings for properties in their area and the amount of fulfillment they have in their lives. <laughs> it's sort of all you need to say, but it's not all I'm going to say, because the idea that money will buy happiness is as old as uh, life itself. It just feels to be particularly uh, alluring right now, um, and, uh, but also the one of these that's the most clearly um, fictitious. Uh, Abigail Disney, uh, the heiress to, one of the heiresses to the Disney fortune, was quoted, she did a journal, um, she did an article or an interview somewhat recently about uh, what it's like to inherit that amount of money. And she said this, she said, they did a study at the Chronicle of Philanthropy where they asked people who inherited money, vast sums of money, what amount of money would you need to feel totally secure? And every single one of them, no matter what they had, named a number that was roughly twice what they'd inherited. So that's what you need to know about money, right? This is a form of the law. If I got enough, I would be enough, uh, if then. And it is also an outside-in approach, like almost all of these are. Therapy is not really an outside-in approach in the same way, but most of these seculosities say that if I can change my circumstances on the outside, uh, then I will sort of be able to control and manufacture uh, spiritual health um, or simply happiness. Now. Uh, the best uh, takedown of that idea of the outside-in approach to um, 
uh, spiritual enlightenment is the one that Adam Sandler did on uh, Saturday Night Live. We're going to watch that clip right now. This is from a couple years ago. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen it. History. Spaghetti. <laughs> These are the things of a boot country called Italia. Hello, I'm Joe Romano of Romano Tours. For two generations, my family has provided high-quality tours of Italy to people from all over the world but mostly Long Island and Jersey. <laughs> we saw all of Italy in a bus, okay? We ate every day incredible. Yeah, I got to look at the Pope and he even told me happy birthday. Thanks, Thanks for all Romano tours. tours. <laughs> Explore the old country with our award-winning 10-day vacation package. See Venice, the city of wetness. <laughs> Point and laugh at the Tower of Pisa. And play with some dough in Napoli. People love us, but every so often a customer leaves a review that they weren't, they were disappointed or didn't have as much fun as they thought. So here at Romano Tours, we always remind our customers, if you're sad now, you might still feel sad there, okay? <laughs> you understand that makes sense? Our tours will take you to the most beautiful places on Earth. Hike the cliffs of the Amalfi Coast, fish with the nets in Sorrento. Do this, I don't know. <laughs> but remember, you're still gonna be you on vacation. <laughs> if you are sad where you are, and then you get on a plane to Italy, <laughs> in Italy, you'll be the same sad you from before, just in a new place. Does that make sense? <laughs> There's a lot of vacation you can do. Help you unwind, see some different looking squirrels. <laughs> deeper issues, like how you behave in group settings, or your general baseline mood. That's a job for incremental lifestyle changes sustained over time. I want to be very clear about what we can do for you. We can take you on a hike. We cannot turn you into someone who likes hiking. We can take you to the Italian Riviera. We cannot make you feel comfortable in a bathing suit. We can provide the zip line. We cannot give you the ability to say we and mean it. You're not your sister. We can provide you with a wine tasting tour of Tuscany. We cannot change why you drink. Okay? I'm sorry, but it's true. And our friendly tour guides are happy to take your picture. But remember, the pictures you're in are gonna have you in them. <laughs> and if you don't like how you look back home, it's not gonna get any better on a gondola. <laughs> All right. <laughs> kind of the final word on the church of materialism, because travel, luxury travel, is certainly included in that. Um, but when we're talking about recreation and, and, and travel and sort of leisure time, I think we, it bleeds directly into the next uh, church that I want to identify. And all the pastors in the room are going to nod their heads. Let's put up the next slide here. This is a New Yorker card cartoon. Keep your eye on the ball, then catch it. Then obsessively develop your skills to land a baseball scholarship, get recruited to a major league team, and finally make me happy. <laughs> what I'm talking about here is the Church of Youth Sports. And uh, I know it's, a, it's, it's, it, we're, it's close to the bone for some of us. I used to think this was a niche thing that was not that big of a deal, and some, it was somehow something that pastors like to bellyache about. And then I had children of my own, and I had a 14-year-old who played travel baseball. Okay, do you know about travel baseball? You pay a lot of money, you sacrifice all your weekends, your kid gets three at-bats, they strike out two, if not three, times. They're mad at you. You're separated from the rest of your family, and then you go home having also skipped church and the place where you were able to contemplate matters of the soul. I think it's straight from the pit of hell. <laughs> go Mets, okay? <laughs> I was reading an article about this. Catherine Jezer Morton talked about what is it, though, about youth travel sports, youth sports that is so 
incredibly alluring to people. And she had a much more compassionate take on it than I do. She said, a mom of two boys under 10 who play ice hockey, baseball, and lacrosse on the West Coast told me that running practices as a volunteer coach helps her stay active, and the camaraderie with other parents is real, especially as the years go by. Quote, I get to engage with other people, but we're focused on the kids and the logistics and the action, and nobody's expecting anything else. It takes the pressure off of making conversation, making friends, talking about oneself, the kind of things that can be stressful in adulthood. Indeed, to enter into the world of youth sports is to enter into a ready-made spiritual religious universe with established rules and a ton of rituals that welcomes parents to enter in and belong just as much as their children. So in the absence of inherited examples of what family time looks like, sports provides one. This is helpful to me as a person with enormous bitterness about this particular pursuit in America. In other words, becoming a sports family seems like an insurance policy against the tractionless feeling that seculosity creates in kids and parents alike. It's a way of raising your children with structure and discipline without alienating them by insisting on following traditions that might seem arbitrary and unfair. So, <laughs> how many of you are going to travel soccer games on Sunday? I don't know. I am a hypocrite, you know? I, I'm not only because I l love listening to Taylor Swift, and I um, go to therapy all the time, uh, I, I, I don't have any money, so that doesn't really matter, but it's, <laughs> I, I, I certainly indulge in the shame and the insecurity of looking at people with a lot of money. Uh, but most of all, I'm at these travel sports games all the time. So I'm not above this, and neither are you. But um, this leads to uh, the last one, which of course, the biggie, is the Church of Political Tribalism. I don't need to tell you much about this. I don't need to illustrate it, but I'm going to. Uh, in 2023, Stanford researchers did a new round of research, and uh, this talking to teens about religiosity, and they, they found that political polarization among teens has increased sharply in the last few decades, the, but the increase hasn't been driven by their peers, which would suggest that kids in general are getting more politically active. Um, it's not due to the internet either. The inc increased polarization that Stanford found was driven almost entirely by parents. So today, not only do parents teach their children who they like, they teach them who to hate. It must be said that more progressive families where religion is absent or vilified seem particularly prone to this form of seculosity. In fact, another new research project sponsored by CNN found that when you talk to grade schoolers about the election, the children of Democratic voters are far more rigid in their thinking than the children of Republican voters. Children of Republicans express less hesitance about entering the home of someone who doesn't agree with their politics. Children of Democrats react with stronger negativity about Republican candidates than the children of Republicans do about Democratic candidates. But um, this is nothing less than the same thing that happened in the 80s when parents on the right uh, accused anyone listening to rock and roll of being Satanists. It's the same exact phenomenon that is going on. Here you have a stern set of doctrines or political slogans that are, we embrace because uh, for the sake of uh, belonging. It feels really good to belong, and that's what political tribalism provides us with in a world that's atomized and increasingly lonely. We are clamoring after belonging. So if you can see your friend with the gazillion signs in their front yard, not as insane or malicious, but as radically lonely, that might change the way you think about them. Um, and by the way, this form of seculosity is very closely linked with the seculosity of celebrity, where candidates uh, create personality cults that uh, often seem very much like 
they are going to tell us to shed our skins in order to ascend to the next realm. So what have I said? I've identified five different replacement religions that dominate our uh, spiritual and cultural bandwidth, places we turn to for spiritual nourishment today. I've said so, though, with the enormous caveat that seculosity is a measure of the pain and loneliness people suffer from and also a measure of how deeply out of touch and uh, um, anti-gospel the church has become in many settings. So... What hope is there for the church of Christ, the church of church? What can a person hear or receive or participate in at church that they can't find at a good brunch or on a mountain hike or on a trip to Italy or at therapy or at a Taylor Swift concert? What is the church actually offering and why should anyone care? Well, for years, I, like you, have watched Christians flail about trying to answer these questions to varying degrees of success. I've watched conservative Christians pitch family values and personal piety as bulwarks against cultural vacuousness. I've watched progressive Christians focus so much on the church's prophetic witness in matters of social justice that they lose sight of the transcendent altogether. The burdens each camp lays upon their adherents are different in substance but not in weight. It's the law with no gospel. I've watched other Christians bang on about community and relationships, still others about self-realization and personality tests, a lot of that. Um, I'm a two-wing three. (laughs) I've seen Christianity reduced to an intellectual framework and and vacuum-sealed away from present day concerns, almost becoming a way of worshiping the past or escaping the world. I've also seen the opposite. I've seen Christianity subordinated to any number of present day political ideologies and made into a spiritual accessory to the movement of the moment. My intention here is not to be ungracious in the name of grace. Many of these approaches to faith have their merits, especially when we have sufficient energy to give them. The problem is that seculosity has burned us out so much that we don't really have that much energy. And what we also, the other problem is that the church cannot do mental health better than your therapist. It will never be as entertaining as the NFL, which recently, as you know, had a merger with Taylor Swift. <laughs> the status anxiety that drives our performancism as parents and our insistence that children continue climbing the ladder of performancism, that status anxiety will always win out. Plus, you can find community at a bar. You can find tradition in Nepal. You can find wholesomeness in Utah. You can find political exhortation everywhere. What you find at church that you cannot find elsewhere is what I would like to call the big relief of God's saving grace, which is to say the absolution of sinners through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we got, and that's really it. But long live the church that preaches that. And I'll end here by looking briefly at John chapter 6, because this is, when I think about the church, this is how I think about it. So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, to whom can we go? Those are the words of men who have looked elsewhere for life. They have looked for spiritual nourishment under other first century nooks and crannies and stones, but they have found it only with Jesus. 
It's a refrain that's worth holding onto and repeating as life deals us its repeated blows. And yet the last place we turn for words of life in a culture of seculosity is usually the church. Speaking personally, I wish there was somewhere else to go, somewhere more validating, somewhere with more cachet, a group of people with a little more credibility. In fact, the Christian faith, to my ears, often sounds pre-modern and gross. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Come again? Why would someone go there? Well, they would go there because there's nowhere else to go. And that's what the church is. When my friend Sarah asked her parents why they insisted on going to church her whole uh, youth, her mother said to her, because we wanted you to have some place to turn when your life fell apart. God, Jesus, he was the person people went to when they had nowhere else to turn. When their other attempts to wrench nourishment and life from something not designed to give it to them failed. When the promises of seculosity finally rang false. That's when they went to Jesus, when they had nowhere else to turn. What I'm trying to say is that people don't believe until they're desperate. But we're all desperate, at least if you dig just a little bit. We might be desperate and simply don't know it. And yet a posture of desperation is also a posture of surrender, which is the posture of faith. Make no mistake, the gospel is a hard thing to receive. Letting go of one's ego hurts. Admitting your own desperation is a drag. Coming to terms with the truth that I cannot feed myself that I cannot generate life on my own steam, that I need to receive something, not achieve something. That stinks. And yet, perhaps the ego death uh, here is part of what it means to participate in Christ's death in the way he speaks about in this passage. To have your hands pried open to receive the broken body and shed blood of your Savior, the forgiveness of sins, the absolution of the sinner. What I'm trying to say here is that you and I don't just need church. We need God, and nothing else will do. However, we need not just any God, not the God of seculosity. We need the wild God, Jesus Christ, who was devastated for our sake drowned and raised to new life. And many times we find him on Sunday mornings. Come to find out that the last stop on the bus is the destination we were seeking all along. Which is a long-winded way of saying to you what the great Southern writer Walker Percy once said in a self-interview he conducted. <laughs> Questions they never asked me after confirming to himself that he does indeed believe in the teachings of the church, he pressed the point with himself. <laughs> How is such a belief possible in this day and age? To which Percy responded, well, what else is there? Thanks for listening. <laughs>